Makiba singing the Click song. She died two nights ago in Italy after a concert. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Our guest is the Pulitzer Prize-winning author, poet, activist, Alice Walker, joining us from Berkeley, California, from her home. Alice, you knew you have met Marion Makiba? I did. I met her after a concert in New York uh, many years ago. Uh, I was sad to be the one to tell you the news yesterday of this great South African singer's death. You said you sat at her feet. In fact, you rubbed her feet. Well, I gave her a foot massage because uh, she was wearing these incredibly tight shoes and her feet had started to swell. And I could see that from my seat in the audience. And so later I went backstage and she was resting and I gave her a massage uh, on her feet. Uh, and explained to her, because she said, oh, but my, my audience expects me to wear uh, what I wear. And I said, well, they don't expect you to have uh, aching feet. Um, and I was, I'm so happy that I was able to do that. That's one of my favorite things to do uh, with people who, who stand on their feet a lot uh, and actually do it for all of us, as she did. And I, I actually feel very joyful uh, that she, not so much that she has left us, but that she fulfilled, she was a relay runner, and she fulfilled her part of the race so brilliantly uh, and sang uh, so much of, um, you know, of what we needed to hear in order to get us to this point of electing uh, Barack Obama. Mm. Well, she did live to see that day. She li did live to see the election of Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, Alice Walker, I wanted to go back in time in your life uh, to talk about the significance of this movement and where we're headed. Uh, you went to Spelman College in Atlanta, um, and you spent time in Mississippi. You lived in Mississippi and engaged in an illegal act. You married a white man in a time when the miscegenation laws around this country uh, were in effect. Talk about why you went south and north and back south again. Uh, well, I was planning to actually just make a beeline for the north, as many black people did, uh, who, who wanted opportunity. Uh, and then I got involved with uh, the movement when I was at Spelman and actually met Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, and I was at the 1963 March on Washington, uh, me and this very sweet man I was seeing. We were both very young. And one of the things, I was sitting uh, in a tree, actually, because I, it, was, it was so packed. And one of the things that Martin Luther King, Jr. said that day was, uh, rather than running away to the north, we should all go back home to the south. Uh, and it, it, was, it seemed the most revolutionary thing I'd ever heard, that you should just go home and struggle from there and, and fight the battles from there. And so uh, I'm from Georgia, uh, but I knew that my parents would be very uh, afraid for me if I tried to. I started some things there. I registered voters in a place called Liberty County, Georgia. But then I decided to go uh, straight to Mississippi and to work in the movement there because they were um, putting people off the plantations who voted, who tried to vote, uh, and they were beating people like Mrs. Hamer, Fannie Lou Hamer. And these people were my people. They were just clearly my people. They, they were, you know, my parents were also uh, living on a plantation, what was left of a plantation. They were sharecroppers, which was, you know, the new name for slaves. Uh, so it was, it was wonderful uh, to be able to go there and to put my education to use um, because it, it had been a hard struggle for my parents to educate uh, eight children. Um, so that's how I got to Mississippi, and we were there for seven years. We, we, we were the only um, legally married, well, in the northern states, we were legally married uh, interracially, uh, but then in Mississippi, of course, we were illegal, and we waited to see what would happen uh, it, because we challenged the law. And what happened? Uh, well, we managed to encourage many other people to, in effect, break the law and, and marry each other if they were in love and wanted to. And also, because there was a case in 1967, a few months after we married, called <clears throat> uh, Loving versus the state of Virginia, um, the law was changed. Ironically. And ironically. So <laughs> 
I always loved that. It was loving versus the state of Virginia. Uh, and so this is how change happens, though. It, it, it is a relay race, and, and we, we're, we're very conscious of that, that our job really is to do our part of the race. Uh, and then we pass it on, and then someone picks it up, and, and it keeps going. And that is how it is. And we can do this as, as a planet with the consciousness that we may not get it to, you know, today, but there's always a tomorrow. Uh, and Barack Obama's election is one of those tomorrows that was so longed for and so sweated for and so believed in and so hoped for. And it's an incredibly moving affirmation uh, of where we have been and who we have been and how we have we have kept so much of what we believe. Alice Walker, on election night, one of the people we spoke to uh, was Dr. Vincent Harding. He mm -hmm. was a close friend and colleague of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, in fact, he wrote Dr. King's major anti-war speech, Beyond Vietnam, the speech that Dr. King gave a year to the day before he was assassinated. The speech was given at Riverside Church on April 4th, 1967. Dr. Harding talked with us, I was with Juan Gonzalez and Jeremy Scahill, about what he saw as his role after Obama won the election. I am much more deeply involved in the hopes for what we can do to help push him into the place that he needs to go. He's taking a good start at this point by winning this magnificent election, but he is not going to be out there as a messiah by himself. We who believe in freedom are going to have to stand around him, stand beneath him, stand in back of him, and do everything that we can to keep reminding him that what we need is to move towards the very thing that he's been talking about, creating a more perfect union, creating a more just and peaceable society creating a more democratic society. So my hopes are very much focused on him, but not on him alone. I see the energy that's been built up over these uh, two years of campaigns, and I see the possibility that we could gather ourselves together and begin to ask in a very powerful way not what should Barack Obama be doing next, but where do we go from here? What is our role as committed, progressive citizens to move to the next stages? Vince Harding, I wanted to ask your uh, reaction. Uh, you're speaking to us from Denver. Barack Obama giving his major address at Invesco Stadium in front of 80,000 people, uh, invoking the name and legacy of Martin Luther King uh, in a speech where he also called for an escalation of the war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, given your history, I was curious of your, your response to some of the rhetoric about King and, and war right now at that event and, and in the broader campaign. For me, that question about the contradictions that would stand between seeing Barack as a second coming of Martin and seeing Martin as someone who clearly understood that militarism was not the way towards the solution of humanity's problems. That's why I said that those of us who believe in creating a more perfect union can only do it by standing around him, under him, behind him, pushing him to ask questions about what is the role of the military in a democratic society. Vince Harding, by encouraging what? him to see the possibility that maybe he would be a better community organizer in chief than commander in chief. Maybe a democracy needs community organizers more than it needs commanders. That was Vincent Harding, um, who worked with Dr. King, uh, wrote the draft of his speech he gave April 4th, 1967.
taking on the war in Vietnam. Uh, we are joined live by Alice Walker, Pulitzer Prize-winning poet, author, activist in Berkeley, California. Alice, your thoughts uh, as you listen to Vincent Harding, community organizer in chief as opposed to commander in chief. Uh, Vincent is a very old and dear friend, and I, I completely see his point, and I think it's very valid. Uh, I think there is a time, of course, when you need a commander in chief uh, in defense of your yourself uh, and and your country. Um, but I think that it is more important uh, for all of us now to take this incredible energy that we see around the planet and turn it uh, on, just turn a real